Welcome to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. And I'm Tana Amen. Here we teach you how to win the fight for your brain to defeat anxiety, depression, memory loss, ADHD, and addictions. The Brain Warrior's Way podcast is brought to you by Amen Clinics, where we've transformed lives for three decades using brain spec imaging to better target treatment and natural ways to heal the brain. For more information, visit amenclinics.com. The Brain Warrior's Way podcast is also brought to you by BrainMD, where we produce the highest quality nutraceutical products to support the health of your brain and body. For more information, visit brainmdhealth.com. Welcome to the Brain Warrior's Way podcast. We are so excited to be back with you and Tan and I are here with Shannon Kennett's and hold on uh, to your socks because this is going to be very powerful. Uh, the, the title is When Your World Changes Immediately. And Shannon and I have known each other. She is the executive director of the International Hyperbarics Association. Uh, she's worked in the field of hyperbaric medicine for, goodness, uh, almost 15 years. She was motivated by the story we're going to tell you today. She's also the executive director of MAPS, the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs, which is a community of physicians that uh, I'm blessed to be able to teach at, internationally recognized speaker, uh, has also appeared on Montel Williams, uh, is opening a new clinic with Jenny McCarthy in uh, outside of Chicago. So Shannon, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Shannon, um, I was talking to you before we got started, and I have to say your story um, is, you know, as a mother, um, is just heart-wrenching. So really happy to have you here today because we deal with this a lot with our patients. So I think it's going to really, really uh, connect with a lot of people. So your world changed. Yes. Immediately. Pretty much immediately. With my so, second so tell daughter, us. Grace. Um, I have two daughters, Lily and Grace. My daughter, Grace, is the one that has special needs. Um, she was born a t you know, typical child, um, and I took her home, and within like a couple weeks noticed that she was doing a lot of eye rolling, and she wasn't really like looking at me or responding to sound. And so I called our doctor, and I said, you know, I think something's wrong. And um, it took me about six months to get an appointment. And um, they sent me to an ophthalmologist first because I talked about the eye rolling and then um, the neurologist and we lived like an hour outside of the city and so they had me go to the ophthalmologist first and when Grace did this eye rolling he said I believe your daughter's having seizures and so they took us by ambulance to the hospital and then the neurologist met us there and um, they first thought she just had epilepsy that you know we we're in the ER they said we're gonna have to hospitalize her they put her in the intensive care unit to get the seizures under control and I thought okay epilepsy I had a friend in high school that had epilepsy I can handle this and we entered the hospital when Grace was three months old, and we left when Grace was three years old. Um, the medicine wasn't helping Grace's seizures stop, and for that first basically three years of life, Grace had a round of probably the 15 different biopsies, including an eye biopsy, rectal brain biopsy. We were oh transferred back and forth between our home-based hospital in Madison, Mayo Clinic, and New York Presbyterian. And um, they, my daughter was dying, and they didn't, they couldn't figure out the cause. Um, and then when they finally told me, and I remember being in Mayo Clinic when her, when one of her biopsies came back from New York, and they had a diagnosis. And I remember being so excited because I thought with the diagnosis, you're going to have a prognosis, and you're going to fix it. You know, it's medicine. And these doctors are going to tell me now we can do this. But in the same breath that they told me that um, with what Grace had, she had a mitochondrial cytochrome C reductase deficiency. They told me that at that time, um, there's only four other children cited with that type of mitochondrial disease, and all four had died before oh the gosh. age of two. And at the time of that particular diagnosis, Grace was a year and a half. And so they basically told me to take her home and make her comfortable and let her go. Oh, and wow. I just remember thinking, this isn't happening. You know, I can't, I can't let my daughter die. Wow. So, and she was your second child. She was my second child. So th th 
the first child is becoming traumatized by the chronic stress mm -hmm. that and I, and I really, is going on in the family. Yes, and Lily was with me at all times. Um, I thought that was really important that she stayed with me and um, stayed with her sister. And um, it was just a, it was a huge roller coaster. I mean, when you, when you have a family, you're, you're never expecting to get news like that. And, you know, one of the things I've learned that, you know, we really, really, truly need to be thankful for our healthy kids, because at the end of the day, there's really like more that can go wrong than yeah. can go right. And I think that that's a real lesson to learn that we really need to feel very blessed and very lucky to have, you know, healthy children. And because when you're faced with this type of a situation, you know, you can either completely collapse and, and go into a gray, dark place, or you can say that you're not going to listen and you're going to find things that can possibly help your child live a, a better life than what you're being told. You know, as a nurse, um, I certainly saw these situations happen a lot at the hospital, but you never think it's personal. You don't think it's personal until our granddaughter was born with a, with special needs. Um, we didn't know it either. She was five months old when we found out. And, and it started with seizures. started with seizures, and it was wicked. And she was one of 50 cases that had been diagnosed. Um, and they said that most of these kids had died before the age of three. So similar um, dynamics there. Um, and I... You know, it's one thing to deal with the physical aspects of what's happening with your child, which is devastating. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing that the hardest part in the hospital were the parents. The hardest part was the parents because there's nothing you can do. The caretakers are just devastated. They're exhausted. But when you're dealing with that firsthand, I remember, um, you know, our oldest daughter who the, the the myriad of emotions going through you, the guilt, the fatigue, the um, the just total despair, not knowing what to do, um, not believing the doctors, like trying to figure out an alternative, and just the also there was a level of I can say this, um, it's not really it, it maybe it shouldn't be that way, but there's a level of shame almost with like how you handle it or, you know, the guilt. Um, there's at least that's what we saw, oh, what yeah. we witnessed. Absolutely. And it was just heartbreaking to watch that happen and be a part of it and know that you can't take and it she away. she had more resources than most people right. have. Yeah, I mean, right? you know, this was... You but know, at Grace, that time, yeah, you did Right, Grace is 18. So, so, so mean, tell now, us more about so, the journey. You know, basically, when great when we got the diagnosis, then they transferred us back to our home base hospital in Wisconsin, and um, the doctors. You know, we had the diagnosis, and so now they really didn't want to do much more. You know, to um, save Grace because they said figured there was like no point. Obviously, our private insurance dropped us. You know, like a year before when her bills reached over ten million dollars. So now Grace was just on full Ouch. disability. So they um you know really said you just really you have a healthy daughter you need to take grace home make her comfortable and you need to let her go and i remember you know when we went back to the our hospital in madison um our neurologist had pulled in my whole family um and so there's probably really like 25 to 30 people my brothers and my aunts and uncles very close into this room and i I thought that the the doctor was going to be talking about what things were going to be going on with Grace, and that you know I'm going that I need their support, you know, to because Grace is going to have a long road and so forth. But really, it was more of an intervention to for me for them to convince me to let Grace go, and I think that that moment in my life really changed because I knew as a mom that there was no way that that I could be a good mom to my other daughter oh. had I not tried everything for grace. And so in that moment, and they even had our family priest in the room. And I remember when they were telling me that I needed to let grace go and, you know, they brought actually brought in catalogs and they were asking me to like, look at caskets. I mean, and, and as beautiful as a pink casket is, wasn't something that I thought that I could ever do. And I remember, finally just standing up and saying, you know what? And I remember looking over at my family priest and going, I'm really sorry, because I'm going to swear. And I basically told people to get the hell out of the room if they weren't going to support me and support everything that I could do for Grace before I let her go. And if they couldn't do that, then they needed to just be out of my life for right now. And they needed to let me do what I needed to do. And I'm a psychologist by trade. I, I know how things go with with 
marriages and divorce with special needs. And my husband and I had completely two different views on whether to let Grace go or not. And, you know, the hospital actually, you know, what people don't realize is hospitals can make decisions to let your children go when they're on life support. And um, I lost that battle. And um, so I took Grace out of the hospital um, in the middle of the night with my parents. And So um, you basically took her AMA, which is I against did, medical advice. I did. I took did. Her- because I had heard so many parents, when our, when our story hit national news, so many parents contacted me and said, Shannon, you really need to try this therapy called hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And that's really how I learned about it. I learned oh, about wow. it from parents, not from physicians. And they said, even though your daughter doesn't have cerebral palsy or traumatic brain injury, she has a lot of those same characteristics. I mean, at age three... Grace, on a good day, weighed 15 pounds. Oh, wow. She had a feeding tube. She was blind. She'd have anywhere between 100 to 200 seizures an hour. Oh, my gosh. She had infantile spasms to the brain. She had bone marrow biopsies, oh. transfers. She was just a very free, fragile child. And like, just try it. And I thought, okay. And so I did these little fundraisers, and I raised money. And it wasn't like I could give the money back because some people sent in like a dollar, you know, five dollars, you know. And um, so I took her out of the hospital and drove her with my parents and Lily. And to Florida. And they actually told you if that she, if she died, that you would be charged with murder. Yep. Wow. Charged so they were going to take her off life support. Let me get this straight. <laughs> they were going to take her off life support, but if she died in transfer, you were going to be charged with right. murder. Yeah. Wow. They were going to remove her feeding too. And they weren't they were willing to try it. that therapy. No, they were not willing. I, one of my doctors was, and one of my doctors, the, one of the intensivists in the hospital was like, you know, it's not going to hurt her. And I don't know if it's going to help her, but if it helps you let go so that you can move right. on with your life um, and it might give her a chance. We just don't know because for sure we don't know because she's one of five kids with her type of diagnosis. Right. So he's like, you know, you need to do what you need to do for your family. And thank goodness. I mean, I, I had no idea that hyperbarics was going to work the way it did. So you took her out of the hospital. You drove her to Dr. Neubauer's clinic in Florida. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? Well, we actually got checked into Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital first um, because she was having issues with her feeding tube and so forth. And the doctor there, and I was trying to have actually a spec scan done before I did hyperbarics with Grace. And um, we were in the hospital and they had a spec imaging in the hospital. And I talked to the doctor and I said, is there any way that you would do this for me while she's in the hospital? Um, Otherwise, we would have done it outpatient at Dr. Neubauer's clinic. And um, he said, I I don't know why you would want to do it. It's it's you, your daughter's you know, not going to live. And I said, and I explained the situation. I couldn't return the money that I had to do the hyperbarics. And so Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital was the first to- oh, um, wow. place that did Grace's spect imaging. And she's had several, but that was the first place. And um, we did it. We She got, you know, well enough for us to leave and go to the hotel. And we started hyperbaric therapy and it forever changed our life. Oh, wow. So how did it change things? It changed things because my daughter finally looked at me instead of through me. My daughter now is, you know, they, they the first, you know, we raised enough money to do 80 sessions and um, she started to move her fingers and try to lift her head up. And um, we noticed that she would grab for things without us rattling and, you know, she, we were told that she would never see. So we knew that the vision was coming back. And so we ended up going back to New York um, to see the, the specialist there. And he said, sure enough, that her, you know, she had completely complete optic atrophy and finally the nerves were starting not to be pale blue anymore and um, she started to get her sight back and so we raised more money went back and did some more hyperbarics and because back then hyperbarics was not accessible as easily and it was more expensive than what it is for families today because of the mild portable chambers that you can have Um, and so um, and now you know going into hyperbarics you know grace was three years old 15 pounds blind seizures feeding tube never walk talk um, had no idea that I was her mom. And now my daughter is 18. She's going to be walking the stage at graduation. She no longer wow. has a feeding tube. She's she gone walks. To prom. She walks. She went to prom. She went to prom. Um, she talks. She wow. swims. Oh, she I should bikes. show her a picture. She's beautiful. Yeah, she is. Um, we just had some senior pictures taken of her. Oh, my gosh. And she is just, and she's happy. But, you know, she, most of the time, she's so cute. She knows I'm her mom. Can you guys actually see that at all? So for those of you who just listened to the podcast, you can also find it on YouTube as well. But, I mean, this story is just heart-wrenching and beautiful at the same time. It's just about not giving up hope. So 
I want to spend the next just couple of minutes we have going, what are the big lessons you've learned when your world changes immediately? In That's those, a big change. Like in, the, in those first like months of it changing, um, the biggest thing that I learned was that it was okay to be angry and it was okay to grieve somebody and that was still alive because you did get something taken. You know, I thought I was going to have, you know, the perfect family and I was going to, mm-hmm. you know, my Lily finally had a sister and um, I learned that it was oh, that I could cry and I could let things be the way they were and, but I couldn't stay in that moment that, you know, the, the biggest lesson I learned was that I needed to grieve. I needed to cry. Um, I needed to let go of people. I needed to put myself yeah. around positive people. And sometimes that's really hard because it means that you lose, you know, family and like good friends that you went to college with or high school with that kids are the same age. And, you know, the, the lesson there is that we all go through different things in our life at different times and people come in your life for a purpose. They leave your life for a purpose. And, you know, and if it's a friendship or a bond that's meant to happen later on when you're in the right place, it's going to happen. But you shouldn't feel bad about telling people that they can't be around you if they're just going to be negative because you're going to have a lot of negative. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of tears. You're going to, I mean, I remember a time where I would ring like a cowbell before going into Grace's room when she did get to come home because I, I didn't know if she was going to be alive or if she would be gone. Mm. And I didn't know if I could handle it not hearing something from that room. And then I would have sent somebody else in the room. So, I mean, that was one of the biggest things that I learned was like just learning to like let go, but then stand up for yourself and stand up for your decisions. And that's a tough thing to do with family. It really well, especially is. Especially when the doctor is organizing a coup <laughs> right? Uh, and yeah. getting you to give up. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I just want to touch on that. Cause I, I, I just, I remember going through, um, seeing our daughter go through something very similar. Um, maybe not to that extreme, but I remember the, she had the name picked out because she had this vision of, you know, her little girl and, you know, the wedding and the proms and the dances and the ribbons and the, she had a vision. I mean, we all do, right? We have a vision of what our family is going to be like. And that mismatch of this isn't, this isn't happening. This can't be real. Um, And then, and then she had shame and guilt over her own feelings about that. And it was, and didn't even bring oh, Emmy to so some painful. events because of how she felt. Well, because and she couldn't handle people. She adored that child, and she could not handle other people looking at right. her in a way that she felt, you know, was less than perfect. And so I just remember that. that but that breakthrough happened when she was able to do that, and everybody. It was a huge breakthrough, but I just remember so that much. early, and that's um, normal. Like that's, I think that that's okay. That's normal. And yeah. it's important to have somebody to talk to right. about it. I well, mean, we want know. you as our in our tribe, so we're so happy to have you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm so we're going to come back, and when we come back, we are going to talk about the science of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Stay with We've us. We've got Shannon all week, right? We have Shannon for the next couple of podcasts, so stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Tan and I are here with Shannon Kennants. Our um, hearts are weeping, but open. Oh, amazing story. And we are going to talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is actually something I learned about from Dr. Usler. And Dr. Usler is a nuclear medicine doctor in LA. And both he and I have been doing brain spec imaging for close to 30 years. And he's like, look at these scans before and after because spec measures right. blood flow and activity in the brain. And you'd see damage scans. I mean, terribly damaged scans with low overall blood flow. And then they were better. And sometimes they'd be better 
after the first session That's of hyperbaric amazing. oxygen. And, and I'm like, healing with oxygen. Now, there are no side effects. Uh, what a thought, right? And we always believe here at Amen Clinics, first do no harm. First do no harm. And so I started sending people and Paul Correa is one of the uh, Anaheim Ducks, the hockey. Uh, he had headaches every day for 12 years and had eight concussions. And after just a couple of hyperbaric sessions, the headaches went away. And then he started sleeping better. And I'm like, okay, I'm impressed. And then I did a study with Paul Harch on soldiers who came back from Iraq and Afghanistan who had blast injuries. And we saw even after the first session, increased blood flow to their brain, improvements in mood. And so I've been an advocate for a long time, but it literally saved your daughter's life. Yeah, it did. I mean, we, I mean, she wouldn't be here today without the hyperbaric therapy and she still, she loves her chamber. She every day after school, she goes right into oh, her that's chamber. Amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, she, she definitely knows it makes her feel better. You know, I live in Wisconsin. So do, during like the winter time, you know, she, I make sure that she goes in every day so that she doesn't catch colds and flus and things like that. And so, um, yeah, she, it is definitely the thing that, you know, that saved her life so that I can then get her into other types of therapies and, you know, do nutrition with her and so forth and, um, and get her, you know, better on all the other areas, but hyperbarics is what saved her. So life. I remember when I first when I first met you, and you were telling me that you used hyperbaric oxygen for patients for brain issues. I was like, "What?" I had not heard of that, even though I was a neurosurgical ICU nurse. We used it for trauma, for you know, for trauma to the skin, for skin diseases, for you know, traumas to help them heal. And I thought, well, that makes so much sense. That's like logical, but we had never used it for that reason. Right, and it's approved by Medicare for 14 wound healing right, indications. Wound healing. And if you have a traumatic brain injury, hello, that's a it's wound. Right. Or you have a stroke. It sort of seemed logical. That's a wound. Absolutely. But yet the government and most insurance companies actually don't cover it right. for wounds to the brain. Brain, which is how crazy is that? I mean, we'll give you six, seven, eight, ten medications. Which have side effects. Right. And right. We, we won't start with the simple things first. So you are the executive director of the International Hyperbarics Association because you're so passionate yes. about this. So is there any science? You know, people are like, they're, they're like, oh, there's no science behind that. Yeah, there actually, there's a lot of science behind it. And there's a lot more studies that have been happening, especially like in the areas of pediatrics. There's been autism studies done. Um, there's been cerebral palsy studies done. And um, there definitely is the science behind it. I think that the, the thing that I run into um, when I have like gone and worked with the FDA or I've gone and tried to get different indications covered and done that through the IHA is that because it's so simple, like I, th I think it's because, you know, we all need oxygen. I mean, you know, we right. can go without food for so long. We can go without, you know, drinking water for so long. But a few can, minutes without air. Right. So it's, it's really one of those things that, and because it seems to help so many things that then automatically the medical establishment jumps to conclusion that, you know, the biggest thing they say it's snake oil. Well, you know, if you or talk placebo. to the, or, or placebo effect. Except placebo doesn't know, boost blood flow right, to the brain. You <laughs> know, and so, I mean, it, it, you know, I think that, um, I think we're, we're getting somewhere. I definitely think with the studies that, that are out there now, other countries are picking up. There's a study that was just done in Thailand they just took 10 children that had autism and they did 10 sessions at 1.3 and after those 10 sessions they saw so for people who don't know 1.3 is atmospheres yes. or the level of pressure right. so one is sea level right and uh, the lower you go under the water the more, more. pressure right. and so 1.3 is what about 10 feet under the water yes. that kind of pressure right. if you and go to 1.5 it's like 16 feet yeah. under the water and uh, so breathing oxygen under pressure has been shown to be healing now many people think well you have to have a hard chamber and when you went to florida and 
Dr. Neubauer's clinic, he had a hard chamber. Right. Was he using 1.5 or even well, higher? Well, Grace, in, even in the hard chamber, because of her seizures, we were at 1.1, but 100% oxygen. Um, and we finally got up to 1.3 with her. That's all, you know. And I've done a little bit higher pressure later on in her life, and it didn't do well for her. So she's really a 1.3 kid. Um, but what, what the studies are really starting to show now is that, you know, before when they thought it was, you know, the 100% the oxygen that was making the difference, it's really just that little bit of pressure that we're needing the pressure. So it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily and these the studies are 100% like, no. oxygen. So the study that was out of Apollo Hospital and McGill University, they took, um, you know, 1.3, 1.5, 1.75. They did, you know, 1.3 room air, 23% increase. And they did, you know, the 100% with 1.5 and 1.75. And there showed no significant differences in all the improvements between them. So, and then the original McGill study. And was their conclusion that yeah, it worked no better than placebo? Right. And see, because that's, they used the right, 1.3 as a placebo. So, so they drew so much controversy. So it, the, what they ended up having to do was they went back. And, and then they changed the study because what happened is they said, well, wait a minute, you know, how can you have a placebo if, you know, it's a placebo right. effect, da, da, da. But really it was hyperbarics what they were getting, right. you know, by going under that pressure. Doesn't make any so sense. then they changed that to an actual therapy group and then just had the other placebo group just do the traditional PT, OT, speech, different things like that. And so that changed the whole outcome of that study. Right. And that study is really what showed us that it was more about the pressure than it was about the 100% oxygen, what makes, which makes a big difference to patients because now it becomes more affordable. And it makes a big deal to me when I'm trying to change the way the laws are because, you know, when you go into any insurance company or, or governmental agency and they look at hyperbarics, they're going to look at those 14 indications and they're going to look to see what they've been paying out and they pay thousands of right. dollars for one treatment. Well, when you look at Grace, and I've had over 5,000 treatments, of course they're not gonna pay for Grace's session. So what we're trying to show them is that it doesn't have to be that expensive. But when you are in a system where they've been used to paying and they, they, they don't wanna ever admit, they, you know, they don't want so to change. So you're trying to create a revolution. Mm -hmm. And what's the first thing people do to revolutionaries? They kill them. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I've been trying to create a revolution in mental know, health, yeah. and people have been trying to kill me. You know, I'm uh, like know. hard. I'm hard to kill. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, somebody asked me about that. You know, why is your work controversial? It's because I'm trying to create a revolution. Yeah. How we diagnose people in psychiatry is wrong. I mean, without using imaging, it's just stupid, yeah. right? To not get more information. Right. And so, if you say the emperor, you have no clothes. The emperor doesn't get all lovey-dovey with you. He tries to kill you. <laughs> and, and and that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. You're, you are disruptive. But no one's yes. ever called you that, probably. But you're disruptive <laughs> <Not today. laughs> to, <laughs> to a financially right. um, lucrative yeah. business. And you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, people can get home chambers. It's so much less expensive. I mean, you can have a home chamber that you can use for the rest of your your life right. for the same cost is mm -hmm. about 10 sessions and you know yeah. for these expensive chambers so i want to i just want for people who didn't hear our first session i want to make sure that everyone gets this straight your story is really dramatic like they were going to take your daughter off life support you were they basically tried to stage a coup to you know let override you yeah. and and force you to let her go um she was that sick um, blind mm -hmm. and not going to live. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing you say is that hyperbaric oxygen literally changed her life. It, and How it changed her, 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 it changed her medically. I mean, like Grace's case, you know, her doctors at Mayo Clinic have started to like look at and writing her up. The lady that did her um, muscle biopsies out of Buffalo Children's Hospital, I was at a conference that I went to specifically to meet her. And she's like, what are you doing? Because we've never seen tissue change. Now remember, you know, Grace is one of those kids because she has a rare disease. They're always testing her and all the, her testing is changing. Even the, when we went after four, 40 sessions, you know, the kind of mindset I am. So like, 40, I wanted, that's my yeah, question. How many, when did you see the well, biggest we change? Saw, we saw changes 
pretty quick with Grace because she was so severe. But right around 40, 45 is when we really started to notice the eye stuff. And we were told she'd never see. I took her back to Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, the same radiologist, and said, can we do a repeat scan? Because I'm telling you, some I, I need to know if Did I'm imagining it. Did she have it. the deficits in her occipital lobes? Do you yes, remember on yes, her spec scan? Yes. Because I remember Dr. Neubauer showed me a child it was who was Grace. three had holes, yep. which is just decreased blood flow in her temporal lobes, that then after the sessions didn't have the holes. Well, when we went back to Joe DiMaggio after the it was 45 sessions is when we probably had the scan done. In his report, he wrote dramatic improvement. And then he physically called me and told me, I stand corrected. You wow. need to continue to do what you're doing for your daughter. And so, and then we've, we ended up having scans later on with Dr. Usler and, you know, so, I mean, like with Grace, we have all that stuff to show. I mean, we can, we can show her muscle biopsy, her, you know, she was only 14% functioning in her mitochondrial um, cytochrome C. So it would be like in chamber three and four of the mitochondrial. And when we had her last muscle biopsy, I stopped doing muscle biopsies when she was, I think, nine years old. Um, it was 85% functioning. Wow. And she went from blind to glasses to not wearing any glasses. So, I mean, and she can see a little tiny speck of paper and she'll just go right over to it. I mean, and hyperbarics is the only thing that I had done that. And so I know that that's what so changed So healing her life. with oxygen. That's why we do it at Amen Clinics mm -hmm. because we see so many scans that have overall low blood flow, either from Lyme or toxins mm -hmm. or many of our artistic kids and it's uh, it's just one of the important tools in, in the it, toolbox yeah. so it's indicated for what kind of indication so let's it'd let's be, talk it about would it. be like it would be indicated you mean for the ones that insurance would pay or just for yes, what we're both. doing so, so let's talk stuff about that would insurance would pay for would be more things like the wounds diabetics right um, that's what i know, saw like certain spider bites like anybody's ever been necrotizing tested on like the skin bite. diseases the yeah, rotting flesh yeah carbon you know? monoxide like you know dog um, bites you know so carbon yeah. monoxide which Poisoning. causes overall low blood yeah. flow yes. to the brain but the so problem with that is that unfortunately you get it like we always treated in the place of Grace Clinics, firefighters can treat for free. And so we would have them come in if they ever ended up having any issues and stuff. But what happens with, you know, anybody that gets carbon monoxide poisoning, you get them to a hospital, they'll give them like one or two sessions, and then they stop. But what they don't realize is that they've already had some brain damage and you need to continue right. with doing that because you're not going to clear out and they're going to have that fogginess. They're going to have, you know, some some things that happen still later on, you know, especially if they had long term exposure. So, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, we gave it to them right away. It really didn't make a difference. And I say, well, you should have done it longer, you know. And so those are the things that they'll, the, they would cover, you know, Medicaid, Medicare and private insurance. Um, the things that we're really focusing on are. Um, neurological conditions. We're, we're focusing on like pediatrics would be like pediatric stroke, near drownings, autism, cerebral palsy, um, mitochondrial disorders, um, any type of GI issues, um, Lyme's disease, and then adults, the same thing, neurological, you know, deal out with soldiers, you know, coming back, blast injuries, concussions is huge mm -hmm. right now in hyperbarics, lots of doctors, you know, doing research on concussions, which is like a huge thing, and especially because of, you know, our kids starting sports so young, and, you know, it's such a competitive field, parents wanting their kids to, you know, compete in college and then go pro and so forth. So, so Ray so. Lewis, the famous Baltimore Raven linebacker mm -hmm. um, put a hyperbaric chamber in his home and uh, Joe Namath yeah. who was headed toward dementia yes. uh, went and had a spec scan and then had many I don't know how many hyperbaric sessions and then had another spec scan and he said it's just the best thing um, and it was crazy the New York Post you know goes Joe Namath you know endorses controversial <laughs> therapy I'm like he gets better why isn't that the news right, right. well you, you know it's just so crazy what people focus on but the, the reason I do it I mean you know, I have I have all sorts of medications I can give people, right. and it makes them come back. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I give them medicine; they have to come back and <laughs> they get, want get another script. <laughs> um, but we always go, well, what's the natural way to right. heal? And oxygen under pressure is powerful. It is, and you know, when you're when you're faced with any type of um, health crisis. 
I think that our country really need. Well, a I think our country needs to you know focus on prevention. Um, you know, but I also think that um, you need to really look at the quality of life. And I think that you know, obviously with Grace, hers was very dramatic. I mean, like really it was, dramatic. You know, I have. I have my daughter, you know, and she's graduating high school next month. And I went to you know, prom. And she wow. went to prom and she has typical friends and, you know, and she loves life. I mean, she's just larger than life. And I adore both my daughters. But um, the quality of life for her changed. And like, who is to say that, you know, that you take a stroke patient and now they're able to, you know, finally, you know, zip up you know, their jacket or they're able to feed themselves. That's huge for that one person. Of you know, course. maybe they maybe they, they are still using a cane, but you just gave them back dignity and you did it because you gave them hyperbarics, which is a safe therapy. And I think we need to start focusing more on that you don't have to be a perfect individual in order to to be okay. That, you know, there are people that of all walks of life that have all of types of disabilities and that we need to start realizing that. Yeah, I actually it's don't like a, that word. Yeah. It's I not, hate the word disabled. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? Too. Like it's it's yeah. just focus and on what you can, can do, not do on what you right. can't. You know, and and I think that if we focus more on that, because they are able to just differently, just differently, <laughs> so. exa exactly right. That you would that we would see more people accepting hyperbarics because it's not necessarily. I don't like it when people say cure. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I think that it supports it supports everything that we've done. Healthy blood flow to your brain. Yeah, and and I have a happy kid, and I and I've met thousands. And it's of been patients. shown in some animal studies to increase stem cell production. Yes. Wow. And the hippocampus. So I have a new book I'm working on that's coming out in November called Memory Rescue. So I've spent a lot of time with the hippocampus, these seahorse-shaped structures. I've been hearing a lot about seahorses. So I'm starting to collect seahorses and what grows them and what shrinks them. Mm -hmm. But the hippocampus is one of the few areas of the brain that every day produces about 700 new stem cells. So 700 new sort of baby seahorses. And there are things you can do to suppress that number you know, smoking pot, drinking alcohol, headbutting soccer balls, <laughs> um, um, not sleeping. And there are things you can do to grow it. And so giving it the oxygen it needs uh, along with the right nutrients right. and diet and so on can, can just be huge. So, so we do it here at Amian Clinics, but how can people learn more? How can they learn more about your new clinic in Chicago or Wisconsin? Yeah. How can they learn well, more you, about you and your work? Well, you can go to shannonandgrace.com. It's a great resource. Shannon um, and, and Grace. Grace. Dot com. Um, and you can go there and there's a lot of videos um, on hyperbarics. I, I even my my older daughter Lily, she talks to parents about oh, wow. how to really make sure that you don't forget about your typical kids as well <laughs> and course. so forth. And then it just has a lot of resources. If you're a parent looking for a physician that, you know, is looking at you know, your child is not the diagnosis that they were given. Um, you can go to the Medical Academy of Pediatrics and Special Needs, which is medmaps.org, and you can go to your state and find a physician that's in your area that it would be like-minded to you about, you know, doing things, which I hate the word alternative therapy, but doing... Doing great, great therapy. Great things, doing <laughs> right, great therapy. It's alternative so, to the yeah. traditional so, sort of things. That or are you not can go helpful. to the IHA website as well, which is IHAUSA.org, and mm -hmm. all those would link you back to the Shannon and Grace um, so if people go to shannonandgrace.com, yeah, they can also find everything. all the other resources. Yeah. Well, you're going to stay with us. When we come back, we are going to talk about the power of imaging and how do you know unless you look. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. We are here with Shannon Kennetson having so much fun in our 
you know, week with kids with challenging needs, uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And today we're going to talk about imaging. And one of the parts, of course, I love about your story is when you took uh, Grace to Florida and she was in the hospital, you said, can she have a spec scan? And they sort of rolled their eyes at you. It's like, well, what would that tell you? Right. And so how did you first hear about SPECT and why was that important to you? So I first heard about it. So I heard about hyperbarics through other parents. And when I started then to do some research, um, I saw some of your literature and, and, and learning about, you know, you can actually measure blood flow. You can measure different things in the brain. And because, you know, Grace had that brain biopsy and we knew that there were issues in her brain, I was like, okay, I wanted to know that hyperbarics was working, not just from the outside where I could maybe see improvements with Grace, but I wanted to make sure that her brain was repairing because that's the kind of personality I have. And then I wanted that evidence. Basically, I did it because I, I knew that if I had that proof and I felt that that scan, if it improved, that that would be my proof that I could take it to places and make them change the rules. So your first scan, so your first scan was a before scan. You wanted, yes. you wanted yeah, it before she, yeah, you started before, the hyperbaric oxygen. We did before hyperbarics. Then we did it after, like right around 45. And then we had a, probably five or six after that as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. And have you seen, did you see steady improvement or did you see that it went forward and backward and what did you we see? We always had steady improvement and then wow. the last two pretty much were the same, um, which really correlates with the last two muscle biopsies that she had that really just remained in that 85% range. Um, so we, even though we were seeing it clinically. But 85% you know, means that your oh, yeah. kid went to prom and right. walked across Absolutely. the stage and yeah. went from being taken off life yeah. support to having a very functional, high functioning life. Yes. And I think that, you know, for me also with the, having the scan done, was then there was other things I could be doing too as well. And I think that, you know, for a lot of people having that, you know, piece that, I mean, it was, it was very enlightening to see that scan in front of me and the doctor say to me, you know, these, this is why you need to let your daughter go. Look at her brain. You know, you need to let her go, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, okay, well, I can't give back $5 or a dollar worth of pennies to the neighborhood Boy Scouts that, you know, gave me donations. And so I'm going to try it. And then, then getting that second scan and seeing the different colors on the scan and seeing the areas were starting to fill in and things were starting to look better mm. gave me hope. Wow. You know, because I saw, you know, I actually had an image to look at to say that, you know, it can be repaired. You know. Well, and one of the things, see if she would have saw me, um, <laughs> we would have seen the devastation. But then I have a program that will actually tell me how much better can she be. So I can actually tell you the no, prognosis yeah. of, um, so for example, I saw a girl from Alaska and she had a door fall on her head oh, that was terrible. and cracked her skull uh, when she was two years old. And uh, she killed her frontal lobes and just had no judgment. Beautiful. But um, when I put it through the program, she wasn't going to get better because she killed her frontal lobes. What I needed to do was get her a guardian to help her with decision making. So there are and, times and all you, the, know, you can all the tell. other things. Right. But I wouldn't want to tell her parents, "Oh, she's going to get better." Then she's but in trouble with Grace because I've I saw Grace's after scan, and if I would have dropped the threshold or put her through my program, I would have went, "This is a kid that can get better," and you know. That's 98 huge. times out of 100, there's a positive prognosis for people by doing the right thing. See, I and I have a new paper coming out on autism. And what we discovered, it's not one thing. No. Stop saying it's one thing because it's not. It's 10 different things at least. Mm -hmm. But for the kids who have low blood flow, either because of an infection or a toxin, um, it can be improved and hyperbaric is just one of the safest things right. to do for it. And 
I think what you said is really important because people don't know when they come here what to expect or when they get a spec scan. And I think that one of the controversies about it is like, oh, we give false hope or, and that's not true. What we help you do is come up with a rational plan. Right. We tell you the truth. Like we know, like like you said, this person has the, the potential to get better. This person you need to make different plans for. So you need to get a guardian for or whatever. And that's that's really important to know is that it's not just you know, pie in the sky thinking. It's like you can't change what you don't know. Well, right. and think of the alternative, which is not to look, which is to make diagnoses based on symptom clusters. And your daughter um, would not be here with us. Right. 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 If I had not. And, and I'm like, I mean, just listening to you talk and like reading your the papers that you've been sending me and stuff, like my next big thing is I'm getting my 20 year old in here to yeah. be scanned. You know, sure. I mean, I, I carry the gene and she has some little things besides just being a pain in the butt 20 year old <laughs> girl um, <laughs> that, you know, it'd be, I, it's beneficial for, you know, to just have that looked at to say, you know, you can see that maybe she's going to have trouble in these areas, you know, because of A, B, C, and D. So I think that, you know, that's an, an incredible thing and people are so lucky, you know, to have And, and it's not around. just for people who are troubled. No. That, when you look, you get serious about brain health. Yeah, well, even our 13 year old. So we use had it that for experience. optimization, and our 13 year old's awesome, but her scan but was it explained so a lot. helpful yeah. because it showed she really had sort of an OCD rigid mm -hmm. brain. Which used to make me crazy. So I didn't understand why she couldn't just let it go. And so seeing that, yeah. I'm like, okay. And it's so. It's brain driven behavior it's not will driven behavior so it led us to okay here are the right supplements for and you she now and she takes the supplements willingly because right. she understands it. right and her cerebellum which is a hugely important part of the brain that people just ignore but was really low in activity and so she was never the kind of kid that wanted to play basketball she quit and i used to get mad that she quit i thought she was just like, like i'm like you cannot quit stuff like you have so i was right. like irritated that she would quit stuff Not and right. what i didn't realize is that she felt incompetent so she for, didn't want to do it for someone who was a little on the worried side and rigid side who felt incompetent it's it's like they didn't think about it once they think about it um, a, thousand a thousand times, times. yeah and and so and now she knows it and she knows coordination exercises are part of her plan to have a healthy brain so she dances like 15 hours a week because she knows it helps her so, so exciting knowing, because that's like all about it, the prevention that right. I was talking about that our country needs to go to. I mean, you know, the scanning, it would be a huge thing. But right. her people go, it. it's expensive. And it's like, uh, no. no, being sick is expensive. Yeah. Having an unoptimized brain is, is expensive. Um, one of the things we, we discovered with our special needs kids is some of them had brains that were just on fire that their brains were working way too hard and i needed to calm them down other times they were just devastated uh and so i needed to really find ways appropriate ways to stimulate them mm -hmm. but if i didn't look i couldn't tell oh, by right. talking to them or by talking to their mom and dad and that's still the standard way kids with special needs are diagnosed with autism or nonverbal learning seems very archaic yeah. it just doesn't seem in this day and age so just kind of walk me and like I'm gonna kind of ask you a question like walk me through this because I, I get a lot of calls from parents and they because they know that Grace has had spec imaging and they know that I'm a proponent of it. I'm always telling parents that they should do this um, and their biggest thing is okay well is it a radioactive dye how do I get my kid to sit still do they have to sit still mm -hmm. are you gonna sedate them so you know what Good are the answers to those so it's not a dye so nobody has an allergic reaction to it like with uh, a CT scan it's a radio pharmaceutical. So nuclear medicine has been part of medicine for 60 years. And they get a little bit of radiation. It's about the same as a CAT scan. So if you fall down the stairs, immediately they're going to do a CAT scan. So hundreds of thousands of CAT scans are done every day in the United no States. No one asks. So it's not that. a dangerous level of radiation. It's sort of a normal medical level. And according to the U.S. government, you can have this level of radiation times 10 every year. So 
it's it's not a big deal, but the critics will get hysterical about it. And I'm like, well, you don't get hysterical about right. an abdominal CT. See, if we did several in a day pain. sometimes in the trauma unit. Right. Um, you do have to hold still. And that's why the triple-headed cameras are so important. Because when we first started, we had single-headed cameras, and it took an hour to get a scan. You're not going to get any kid to sit still right. for an hour. Um, so we can do it in about 15 minutes. And... But you do need to hold still. Otherwise, you know, like if you move when you take a picture of somebody, it's going to blur the image. Uh, for kids who can't, and we have great technologists who, you know, are just sweet and loving and kind to get most kids to sit still um, or lay still. Um, you don't go into a tube. Nobody gets claustrophobic from it. Mom and dad can stand right next to you. You can put on cool music. Uh, you, you need to lay still for 15 minutes. For some of our autistic kids or some of our demented patients, they can't, we'll sedate them. Now, you can't sedate them um, before you inject the medicine right. you ha because otherwise you get a picture of a sedated brain, which is not what we're after. Right. Um, even if they're screaming, it's okay. Um, and we don't like it, but um, we, we need them <laughs> Sometimes awake. Sometimes it's necessary. <laughs> we, we, need we need them awake. And then we'll sedate them so that they can lay still. We have a nurse anesthetist. She comes and does that. We've done thousands of sedated scans. I know some people if they get the diagnosis of autism, they just automatically sedate them. We, we're not like that. You know, okay. it's like, well, let's talk about, you know, can we Other bribe ways. the child right. <laughs> to lay right. still? We're not above bribery. Be we, we're absolutely not above <laughs> bribery. Um, but it, generally, it's an easier procedure. So we did at Stanford a head-to-head -head study with SPECT and fMRI uh, at Stanford many years ago. And they had just a heck of a time getting the kids to be in the MRI uh, too, uh, because it sounds like machine gun well, fire. And it's, it's and it's literally it's, it's claustrophobic, claustrophobic feeling. And with spec, we didn't have any problems getting the ADHD, you know, the hyperactive kids to, you know, lay still so. for fifteen minutes because we were bribing them. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not in this big tube right, that's firing right. at them, you know. And you know, and you know, there are lots of myths and misconceptions about spec. It gives you a diagnosis. It doesn't. It tells you the underlying physiology of the problems you right. see. I mean, I can tell in about ten minutes if somebody has ADHD or they're depressed or they're bipolar or autistic because uh, I've been doing this a long time. Right. What I can't tell is what's going on in their brain and what they're likely to respond to. I can't do that without, the scan. without a map and. You know, you've heard it said a picture is worth a thousand words, yes. but a map is worth a thousand pictures. A map yes. tells you where you are and gives you direction, direction on how to get go. to where you want to go. And that's what you got with Grace. And then periodically, like you're on a journey, yes. you map it and you go, well, how am I doing? We're so we right think way. of it sort of yes. like GPS uh, for the brain. Well, that was perfect. I'm going to use this on my website. And when parents <laughs> contact me, that's exactly what I want. Because I, I, they, people know that I love that I, I, I tell them they need to do scans for various reasons. Um, because I think it is important. And I think the brain mapping is incredible. And I think that's the way of the future. And um, and I just got it from the best person ever. So I'll be able to put that on my website. Was that all of your questions? Did that answer sort of the yeah, questions? Yeah, that did. Because well, parents are. We are just so grateful uh, to Shannon. And you can learn more about her and her work at Shannon and Grace. Dot com? Get dot com. Dot com. Shannon and Grace dot com. So you can learn about um, special needs and the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs maps uh, where I'm blessed to teach. Uh, you can you can get a link to that website to find a doctor that's yeah. been trained um, a completely different way to look at yes. helping uh, children. Uh, you can also learn about her work with the International Hyperbarics uh, Association and uh, all the other amazing things she's doing. Thank you so much for oh, being thanks, with Shannon. us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We have a special gift for you. It's an opportunity to win an evaluation at the Amen Clinics. All you have to do is subscribe to this podcast, leave a review, and rate us on iTunes. To learn more about Amen Clinics and the work we do, go to amenclinics.com. You can also learn about our nutraceutical products 
at brainmdhealth.com. Thanks for listening.